Hello and welcome to BirdWise for August 2007. I'm Tom Schooley. In addition to our regular features, the news calendar and feather report, we'll go to the Nisqually Reach Nature Center. We'll visit the Slater Museum and learn about how birds fly. We'll pull a question out of the email bag and Bert Gutman will tell us about, about birds molting. But first, a bird from our sponsor. This month's bird is one well known to all Americans. It's the bald eagle, Hyliaetus leucocephalus. Bald eagles breed from Alaska all across Canada and generally south to the northern U.S., but further south along both coasts. Migrating eagles are found throughout the U.S. We in Thurston County are blessed with a year-round population and many winter visitors. Bald eagles are, if nothing else, big. Females are larger than males and reach a wingspan of six to seven and a half feet. Large individuals weigh upwards of 14 pounds. Eagles add to their nest every year, and nests reach eight feet across and 12 feet deep. Usually the two eggs take about 35 days to hatch, and the young fledge about 80 days later. Adults tend to the young for a further month. The bald eagle's favorite food is a yummy spawned out salmon. They also hunt ducks, preferring those crippled by hunters. Last winter I saw two eagles working together to snatch a mallard from the water. While mallards are thought of as dabbling ducks, all ducks become divers when a couple eagles are swooping from above. You may be finding a lot of feathers on the ground these days. That's because the birds are molting. Let's go to BirdWise educator Bert Gutman and hear about that process. Hi, I want to take up a timely topic this month. Our feather man, Phil Kelly, leads a weekly walk around the Nisqually Refuge. And even by early to mid-July, Phil was reporting that the ducks have all disappeared. They've gone off into the woods. Now, what's all this about? Well, it turns out that the male ducks are going into what we call their eclipse plumage. And instead of the beautiful colors that they have when they're in breeding plumage, they acquire plumages that are much more like those of females. And at the same time, they lose their flight feathers so that they can't fly. And so they go off into the woods to hide where they're safe from predation. And this brings up the general topic of molting, because all of the birds are molting, not just the ducks. For instance, our common western tanager that looks so spiffy in its plumage of yellow, black, and red is now going into its basic plumage, its non-breeding plumage, where it looks much duller. And almost all of the birds are doing this. The birds of the northern hemisphere are going into a different kind of a plumage during the late summer and the fall. And so this brings up the general topic of, of molting. Now, we have to look at feathers for a minute. The bird's plumage, which is made of feathers, looks very smooth, and it looks as if the feathers are coming out all over the body. But in fact, they're only emerging from a very few areas called feather tracts. For instance, on the leading edge of the wing and down the middle of the head and the back. So the feathers are emerging from these feather tracts and they're overlapping one another like shingles on the roof so that the overall the whole body looks very smooth. Now the question arises, if the feathers can grow in this way, why don't the birds just grow the feathers one time and just let it be? Feathers are made of a protein called keratin and they're very tough. They provide wonderful protection and insulation, but they do wear out. They wear out as the, they rub against one another and as the bird rub, rubs against all of the things in its environment. So the, the birds have adopted a kind of a fail-safe strategy, which means that they, at, period, at certain times of the year, they molt all of the feathers on their body and they acquire a different plumage. And this takes a lot of energy because the feathers on the body are something on the order of 10 to 15 percent of the bird's weight. And so it takes a lot of energy to replace them. And in order to do that, a bird has to eat a lot of protein to make that keratin. Feather grows out of follicles, very much like the hair follicles that our hairs grow out of. And if you look at the growth of a new feather, you see that the new feather starts to grow at the base of the follicle and it very quickly elongates, starting at the tip. And somewhere in the middle of this process, it pushes the old feather out. 
And so a lot of the feathers that you see lying around are feathers that have simply been molted. Now, you might imagine that as the feathers are being molted, the bird might go into a condition where it can't fly, where it's impaired. But this turns out to be something that's really unique for, to the male ducks going into their eclipse plumage. In general, feathers are molted in such a way that it doesn't impair the bird's mobility. If you look at the wing, here's a wing that shows the primary feathers in blue and the secondary feathers in violet. And you can see that the replacement begins right at the point where the primaries and secondaries meet. And then it goes both directions from there. So it means that there may be a time when you can see shorter feathers that haven't fully elongated sort of in the middle of the wing. I see this on crows flying around a lot. Now, it turns out that a bird in this manner will go through a series of replacements, of replacing one plumage with another. The system of molts has been shown very clearly by using the scarlet tanager, which is the eastern equivalent of our, of our western tanager. Uh, if you look at the picture, you'll see that a baby bird first consists of a bunch of little feathers that it wears for a short time. Now, the baby bird in this picture is being fed by the adult female, which is number five. The adult female has that sort of olive green yellow plumage almost all, all, all through her lifetime, uh, even though she'll continue to go through, through molts she doesn't change her appearance at all. But if the baby bird is a male, then during the uh, late August and, and into the fall, the bird will acquire the plumage shown in number four, which is this very greenish, olivey plumage with sort of black wings or brown wings, so it looks very much like a female. And the bird will wear that kind of a plumage going through a molt during the spring and during the fall, but changing its feathers for on the order of two years. And then finally in the spring of its second year, it will acquire the plumage shown in number one. This is the fully adult, what's called an alternate plumage or breeding plumage. And the, the male will wear that plumage during the spring and during the breeding season. But after the breeding season is over, around in July and August, it will molt back into a basic plumage. So it will look very much like number three, again, looking very much like a female. But if you look at the bird in number two, you'll see a bird that's in the middle of molting. So it has a mixture of red and green feathers. So all of the birds, especially passerines, are going to go through this kind of molting process in the fall and in the spring. And this means that if you really want to be an expert and be able to identify all of the birds, you need to be able to pay attention to the basic plumage, to the non-breeding plumage, as well as to the alternate or breeding plumage, which is most commonly shown. And it takes a long time to become that kind of an expert. I know that I certainly haven't become that kind of an expert yet. But all I can do is urge you to do what I try to do, to pick up your binoculars and on the basis of what I've, what I've told you and what you can read in your field guide, go on out and try to observe these birds and try to identify them even in their non-breeding plumages. While watching Eagle Soar, it's easy to wonder about how birds fly. Let's go to the Slater Museum of Natural History and listen to Dennis Paulson tell us about just how do birds fly. There are two wings of a Buix wren and a uh, yellow-rumped warbler. Uh, Buix wren is a little bit smaller than the warbler, but the wren is non-migratory, so it's got a relatively short wing. It really doesn't fly very far at all. The warbler not only flies around during the daytime to catch bugs in the air, but also migrates fairly long distance, so it's just got much larger wings, especially longer wings. Here's a ruffed grouse, uh, a, a chicken-like bird, and this is actually, even though this is a very broad wing, it's to be beat very rapidly. It's a, it's a fast, it's a quick acceleration wing. This is a short wing, so because of that it can actually be beat quite rapidly and yet displace a lot of air and get this bird into the air 
just like that. It's a sudden escape from a potential predator wing. And that's typical of grouse and quail and pheasants and things like that. It's a very distinctive shape. There are really no other bird wings shaped like that. With this, apparently, this little notch in here actually uh, helps that particular rapid acceleration and, and quick lift of a grouse or quail. Here's a mag. Here's a wing of a, a magpie. This is sort of a typical bird wing for rather slow, steady flying. Uh, it's got a series of primary feathers. The hand has what's called primary feathers from about here out. Uh, when a bird flies, it has a combination of, of thrust and lift, just like an airplane does. An airplane has a propeller or a jet engine to give it thrust. It's got wings and tail to give it lift. And a bird uses its wings for, all, for both of those things. The flapping of the wings gives the bird thrust. And again, the wings don't necessarily stay like this. They actually bend and configure as they're flapped and then the actual wing surface itself, which is like an airplane wing, gives them the, the lift. Um, so this magpie is just sort of a general general wing. Or this is a high speed wing. This is a wing that goes through the air rapidly and can be beat very fast and propels the bird uh, over long distances. It's also because it's long and slender, uh, it has a lot of, it has uh, lift near the base or from the, from the area of the wing, gives it lift but the tip is far away from the body, so there's not very much of a tip vortex. When a bird flaps its wings, it creates a very unstable air uh, area around the tip, which is called a tip vortex. And if you put it in a wind, wind tunnel, you'd see that the smoke was swirling around that, whether it was just gliding or flying. But so they're actually pushing those vortices away from the uh, body more, which makes them just more stable in flight, so they can fly very long distances, and they can also even glide on long, uh, long narrow wings like this. And a duck is a good example. Here's the wing of a greater scop. A duck is a good example of a rel relatively long pointed wing for high speed. A duck can flap this wing very fast and move through the air very rapidly. Uh, when the magpie flaps its wing fast, it doesn't go so fast. On the same vein, a peregrine falcon wing. This is one of the fastest known birds. These fly fast uh, on, on the level as well as getting into tremendously rapid stoops from above. And this, of course, is one of the predators on the Dunlin, so can you imagine being this big and having something this big coming after you? Uh, the Dunlin is, they're probably equally fast. The Dunlin can go very fast. The big difference between them is that the Dunlin, being so much smaller, can turn on a dime and the peregrine has to make a big sweeping turn to follow it. So as the peregrine's about to catch up with the Dunlin, the Dunlin turns and the peregrine goes fast. And that's, that's why uh, not every bird that's chased by a predator is caught. There's the, the, the prey has some advantages itself. Uh, these are very different wings than a medio wing, a uh, red-tailed hawk, for example. This is a broader wing. It's a bird that's about the same size as a peregrine. It's a little bigger than a peregrine, but a very differently shaped wing. Uh, this is a wing for soaring. This is a wing with lots of area. It's not for fast flying. The broad tip sort of tells you that it wouldn't be as good for that, but it is good for soaring, so there's a tremendous amount of lift can build up. If you notice the wing shape, it's actually slightly concave underneath. It's concave below, convex above. The air flows, so when the bird's moving forward, air is flowing across this wing, and the air that goes over the wing has to go over this convex surface, so it's, it's not a straight line, it's curving up and over, if I can exaggerate it a little bit. But the air that's going under the wing just goes straight back. It doesn't have to curve underneath, it just goes straight back. So it ends up with, as this air parts, if you can picture that, and comes together again at the rear end, the air on the top has to go faster to meet the air on the bottom. By going faster, it's actually removing air essentially from the top of the wing, and it creates a vacuum up here, and that's what gives birds lift. And if you look at, at many flying objects, they have a slightly convex wing like that for that same purpose. It's a uh, large raptor of the night, a great horned owl. Very, very similar to the red-tailed hawk in size. Uh, great horned owls may perhaps weigh slightly more than red-tailed hawks and in fact are very effective predators on red-tailed hawks. It's well known that great horned owls will find where a red-tailed hawk nest is, not that they do this all the time, and actually come at night and take the hawk right off its nest. This has been reported a number of times. So this is one of the fiercest avian predators there is, a great horned owl. Um, anyway, this is a, uh, not too different in size, but this is a wing actually for, not for soaring, because uh, owls don't soar at all, but they fly very slowly. So they have also have large wings for their size, just like a hawk does, like a beauty hawk. And these wings are actually, allows an owl to fly very slowly, 
obviously the slower it can fly the better off it is because it's cruising around at night looking for prey so the last thing you want to do is fly past at 50 miles an hour when you're trying to spot a little tiny mouse underneath you or something so they fly slowly they also fly silently it's like this the submarine run silent run deep this is fly fly silent fly slow and they have little frills on the front of the wing beautiful little uh, sort of loose barbules on the front of the wing that'll that deaden any sound that you can hear that or not. I could do it with a big swan wing, you'd actually hear it. But the owl doing the same thing is silent because of these little frills on the fronts of the feathers. Let's go to Sheila McCartan and hear what the news of the month is. Thank you, Tom. Each year, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Canadian Wildlife Service conduct the Waterfowl Breeding Population and Habitat Survey. This survey, which is the largest and most comprehensive of its kind in the world, samples 1.3 million square miles of the north central United States, south central and northern Canada, and Alaska. The survey estimates the number of ducks in the continent's most important nesting grounds. Preliminary results from the 2007 survey indicate a total duck population estimate of more than 41 million birds in the traditional survey area. This represents a 14% increase from 2006 and a 24% above the 1955 to 2006 average. There are five species that are at record or near record highs, including canvas backs, redheads, northern shovelers, and there are good breeding conditions on the prairies. However, pintails and scops are well below long-term averages. Annual survey results help guide the Fish and Wildlife Service in managing waterfowl conservation programs under the authority of the 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act. The service works in partnership with the state representatives from the floor fly flyway councils, the Atlantic, Mississippi, Central, and Pacific, to establish reg regulatory frameworks for waterfowl hunting season lengths, dates, and bag limits. For more information on the waterfowl surveys, go to www.fws.gov. The Pacific Northwest population of marbled merlets may yet lose its protection under the Endangered Species Act. A new lawsuit by the American Forest Resources Council seeks to remove the threatened status of the seabird which nests in old growth forests of Washington, Oregon, and California. If the lawsuit is successful, Rules to protect the merlet's old growth forest nesting habitat could be eliminated. For more information on this issue and the marbled merlet, go to the website listed here. And now for the calendar. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge's 20th Annual Summer Lecture Series continues every Wednesday evening in August. Topics include forest canopies, dragonflies, climate change, whales, and wildlife. For a complete schedule and information, go to fws.gov slash Nisqually or call 753-9467. The City of Olympia Parks and Recreation Department has some great outdoor activities planned for August. You can easily include bird watching into these events. For instance, try exploring Puget Sound from a sea kayak. There is a trip on Saturday, August 25th on the Nisqually Delta. The Outdoor Adventure staff will be leading this fun and educational kayak tour. The tours are for beginners and in calm, protected waters. The cost is $49. If kayaking isn't your thing, then join the outdoor staff at a fun and scenic day hike. There is a trip on Saturday, August 18th to the Lower Lena Lake. Bring your camera, binoculars, lunch, and hiking boots. These trips are rated between easy and moderate. The cost for the hiking trip is $29. For more information on the kayak and hiking trip, call the Parks and Recreation Department at 753-8380 or go to their website at olympiawad.gov. On Saturday, August 26th, enjoy spectacular natural splendor on a float trip of the lower Nisqually River. Birds and other wildlife are often seen along the riverbanks. Experienced guides offer professional quality rafts. The $79 fee includes all rafting equipment and a fantastic buffet lunch. This trip is sponsored by the Tumwater Parks and Recreation Department, so for more information, call them at 754-4160 or go to their website listed here. 
For a complete listing of the contact information mentioned here, email us at tctvbirdwise at yahoo.com. We'll close our report today with our avian forecast for August by BirdWise tailman Tom Schooley. Tom? Thank you, Sheila, for that report. Let's go to the feather report. I'm substituting for Phil the Featherman. Shorebirds are moving through in great numbers, adults in early August and juveniles later. Willow flycatchers, western wood peewees, and warbling vireos start moving south and are far fewer in numbers by month end. Swallows seem to be a constant stream going to the south, with tree and cliff swallows hard to find after the middle of the month. Common terns are moving through Puget Sound from the end of the month into September. Go look for them on Capitol Lake or at Lure Beach. A trip to the outer coast will produce great numbers of brown pelicans and hermans gulls. Both of these breed in Baja California and move north in the summer to enjoy our waters. As usual, dress for the weather and don't leave home without your binoculars. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the Nisqually Reach Nature Center. This venture began when Black Hills Audubon contracted with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife to do a nature center at Lure Beach. Last summer, we interviewed Daniel Hull. Let's return to that interview and see what the Nisqually Reach Nature Center does. The mission of the center is basically uh, to uh, look at doing resource education and research uh, to help better inform uh, the communities uh, that surround the South Sound Basin uh, about the importance of nearshore habitat, specifically estuaries, uh, due to the fact that we're sitting on a, a beautiful example of an estuary right here, and also kind of reach out and give people options of how they can be involved with this process. So basically it deals with community involvement, resource education, um, and research, and combining those things together. The biggest draw we have here, uh, above any of this stuff, obviously the aquariums, the, the bird mounts, is our view over um, the estuary. We try to get people involved with, um, you know, interaction, you know, being able to interact with the environment in one way or another uh, on a hands-on technique. Um, but the biggest thing that we really have, once again, is the ability to go out and, you know, I brought down the spotting scope. We have about eight pairs of binoculars and get people to take a look at what's happening out there over the water. Um, you know, it's very hands-on. In fact, now one of the things that we're focusing on is um, citizen science techniques. So it's getting people to uh, get involved with scientific process, uh, doing surveys. Uh, it's basically just looking at presence and absence, you know, what birds are coming in and using restored estuary and habitat. But it gives people that are volunteers, everyday citizens, an ability to come in and get an experience with what restoration process is um, and what does it mean. And more importantly, you know, be part of a, um, a you know a simplified data collection process. The center, uh, the center's been here for a long time. Uh, I'd, I'd almost consider it a historic structure. It was built by uh, William Lur uh, in the 20s, mm -hmm. uh, and I believe he sold uh, this property uh, to the state in 1965, uh, and then it went through a lot of different transitions. Actually, um, you know, it kind of uh, kind of was abandoned for a little while, and then Evergreen State College got involved with doing some research out of the building. One of the things that's really interesting about this particular area is the fact that when you look out at the estuary itself and the fact that it's, for the most part, protected through either state or federal land, uh, it's a process of community members that got involved uh, in the early uh, 70s and late 60s and part of the people that were getting involved to um, help protect the Nisqually estuary worked right out of this building doing bird surveys uh, and nearshore habitat surveys. Uh, so there's a really rich ha uh, history to this particular building when it comes to what you see out there on the delta and why it's here. In uh, 1996, there was a landslide that came into the building uh, and the state actually, with a grant, uh, redid the building in 1996. A good time to be out here during uh, to bird, I would think, would be uh, you know looking at a low tide incoming, mm -hmm. uh, so you can you know watch birds as you know the tide starts pushing birds up on the mud flat. Mm -hmm. so our hours of operation are Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday from 12 to 4 to the general public. But once again. A large part of our mission is doing environmental education programs, which are booked via um, people that um, you know call the center and say, "Hey, we'd like to do an educational program." It doesn't necessarily have to be a school group; it can be uh, any private organization that says, "I'm really interested in learning more about this." To celebrate the 25th anniversary, the Nisqually Reach Nature Center will be holding an open house on August 25th from 
11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Call the Nature Center at 459-0387 for more information. Let's dip into the email bag for a question from one of our viewers. Why are bald eagles called bald when they aren't? Bald eagles are not bald, as you note. They do have white feathers on their head. The bald cause a derivation of the word piebald, meaning Apache black and white. Bald eagles are of very dark brown bodies with white heads and white tails. Therefore, this is an apt description. We'll close this program with a few more questions about bald eagles, such as, when does a bald eagle reach breeding age? Bald eagles take four to six years to reach their breeding age. This is exhibited when they acquire their full white heads and full white tails. How do male eagles court the females? Bald eagles engage in aerial displays of undulating flight and mutual high circling and soaring. Eagles also engage in a daring flight maneuver called cartwheeling, where two birds lock their feet together at high altitude, then tumble and cartwheel toward the ground, breaking apart at the last moment. This may be courtship, but some references consider this one territorial male trying to exclude the other. Thank you for watching BirdWise for August of 2007. If you have any questions, please send them to tctvbirdwise at yahoo.com. We'll see you next month.